Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this talk on security keys and anti-phishing. My name is Sriram Kara. I'm a product manager in enterprise authentication and security. And I have my colleague here, uh, Christian Brand, who is also um, in Google Cloud. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about authentication and security keys in particular. So here is the agenda in front of us. We'll start with a brief refresher on why passwords you know, basically suck. Uh, what are the MFA options we have with Google uh, with a specific focus on security keys? And we're going to be doing a deep dive into a product announcement we made earlier today, an exciting new feature where you can use your phone as a U2F security key. And then if all goes to plan, we'll have some time left for uh, Q&A. So talking of Q&A, uh, we'd like you to try out this new feature called a Dory Q&A, uh, which you can access through the Cloud Next app. If you can find our session, you will find a link below the session description to Dory Q&A. The, the thing about Dory is um, you can ask questions anytime in the app, and then you can also see what questions others are asking, and you can vote on them. And so if there are a lot of questions, we will start with the ones that are most popular and work our way downwards. We also have two mics. We will come to them. Uh, if that's your preferred uh, way to ask questions, you can always do that. Now with that, let's get started with, with passwords. So, so what's wrong with passwords? Uh, for starters, uh, weak passwords are everywhere. But in 2015, uh, a study based on the Verizon data breach uh, analysis showed that these are the two most popular um, uh, passwords uh, that were found in that, in that breach. Um, the thing is, three years later, in 2018, when the, the same analysis was done based on more updated uh, data breaches, um, the situation is still the same, right? I don't know how many of you noticed, but the slide, the, the date in the slide changed from 2015 to 2018. Now, the way uh, organizations typically deal with these weak passwords is uh, by enforcing complexity rules and composition rules. Essentially, all of us have seen them. Passwords should require one uppercase, one lowercase, one, one number, and so on and so forth. Uh, the problem with these composition rules, firstly, is that it, it, it's a pain for users. Uh, users are super frustrated. If you don't trust me, just look at how frustrated that user looks. Right? Um, the other part about these complexity rules is they don't even work. Right? Research has shown that uh, when, ha when you have hardwired uh, composition rules like this, uh, users deal with them in extremely predictable ways, like the replays. A with the at symbol, the add as exclamation mark at the end of the word, and so on. So there are very predictable ways in which uh, users deal with these composition rules, and so uh, they don't really add anything, uh, any, anything significant in terms of security, uh, but it just adds frustration for our users. So right now, the, 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 um, uh, sort of the security best practice is, is to take away the burden from the users. Um, and, and offload uh, the burden onto the, onto the services so that uh, service providers like Google and, and others can enforce what are strong passwords based on current understanding of security best practices, uh, comparing passwords with password breach databases, and so on and so forth. Now, even um, uh, if you have overcome the weak password problem using security best practices, a strong password is no good uh, if it is stolen, and passwords are stolen all the time. So based on uh, our research, here are the top three uh, ways in which um, password is stolen. No surprise there. Data breaches of third-party services, um, malware that log your passwords as they're being typed and exfiltrate them, and the big one, uh, phishing. The reason I said phishing is the big one compared to the other ones is also going back to, uh, is based on some research we did a few years ago when we keep updating that research, um, is um, we looked at uh, a user who was prone to a phishing attack. And let's say the credential was compromised in a phishing attack, and we compared the likelihood of such users getting compromised completely, that is, the, uh, losing access to their account, as compared to a randomly selected Gmail account. So that hijacking likelihood of a phished user was 500 times a, a normal user, a randomly selected user. This likelihood is significantly lower for other forms of credential compromise. And in particular, you can see, even if, if, if your password was, in, was found in a breach, it's only 10 times worse. Uh, whereas if you are fished, it is 500 times worse. The reasons for this difference is also um, uh, is interesting. Uh, this is just one example why, or, or one reason why uh, there's a significant difference between there. It is because we, as a service provider, uh, we can provide certain protections against leaked passwords that don't apply in the phishing case. Like th this is uh, a part of that same program we did a few years ago. We found uh, compromised credentials uh, from various breaches. We found 
a uh, certain number of them were uh, were actually valid passwords for, for their Gmail accounts, and we, we were immediately able to lock those accounts down. Now, this kind of a thing, uh, it is a batch process. Uh, uh, it's not possible in a, in a phishing attack where by the time you come to know of it, it's, it's, it's probably too late. Um, phishing is also becoming more potent um, um, relative to malware. Right? Um, it is becoming more and more possible because of automated phishing uh, kits that are available that even fish multi-factor, as we will see in a moment. Um, and uh, uh, malware is becoming harder to write, and phishing is just brutally effective. So, so phishing is, is, is just, there are just more phishing sites and more phishing kits available now uh, as compared to malware. So it's not all bad news, though. Um, the good news here is uh, at Google, uh, the, even if a malicious actor has a username and password, uh, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, Google is able to do some risk analysis uh, um, you know, based on uh, geographical location, device security, uh, history, and so on, and block 99% of those malicious uh, accesses. But the 0.1% are also important. So th the answer for those 0.1% uh, typically has been multi-factor authentication. Now, multi-factor authentication um, methods, uh, many of them are available, SMS, uh, TOTP, uh, mobile push, and so on and so forth. But many of them have their own problems. Uh, usability is one of them. Um, fishability is, 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 is the bigger of the two. Uh, fish, because in some sense, uh, an OTP is also uh, something that the user knows. It's not a long-lived knowledge, but it's a short-lived knowledge that you just learned like uh, maybe a minute ago. Um, and it can be fished in exactly the same way that the primary factor can be fished. So TOT, uh, the OTPs and uh, uh, most the, tr the traditional MFA methods um, are not really uh, the solution to all of the problems. So the right way to think about MFA is that it, is a, it provides a spectrum of assurance. MFA methods are not all the same. Um, so uh, here's what we would recommend. Right? Any MFA is better than no MFA. That's, that's number one. The second part of it is, of all the available methods, if you put them on a scale, uh, SMS and voice-based codes are the least secure of these methods because not only are they fishable, but they also uh, have other problems uh, that are now well known, which include you know, SS7 vulnerabilities, uh, carrier social engineering attacks, and so on. So, so it's widely now known that SMS is, is the weakest of all of the, of the lot, but it's still better than nothing. The second bub, uh, bucket of MFA methods, we have all, all the other codes. We have backup codes, uh, authentic Google Authenticator or TOTP-based apps, and then mobile push uh, uh, methods, such as Google Prompt. These uh, don't have this, all of the problems of SMS, but still, all these three can be phished. And increasingly, we're finding phishing attacks, uh, phishing kits that make it very easy uh, for, for these to be uh, phished in real time. So the answer to this phishing problem essentially, is, is hardware FIDO security keys. And these are the only MFA method that have been designed to be resistant to phishing you know, from the ground up. So to talk more about uh, FIDO, I'm going to call Christian to come up the stage. Hi, folks. I'm Christian, and I'm a product manager at Google uh, working on strong authentication um, and security keys. So um, I want to tell you a little bit more about you know, what we do at Google to prevent phishing, or, or at least try and curb it. Um, we've had these uh, security keys um, you know, in use on Google accounts for the better part of like three, four years. Uh, and we've even made this statement last year, I believe it was during Next, where we said that you know, no Google account has successfully been uh, phished, or at least Googler. Google stuff uh, has successfully been fished um, since we've, we've deployed the, uh, the security key technology, which is really the primary purpose of this. Um, the, the core issue really that users are struggling with nowadays when authenticating is that they arrive at a website and enter their credentials, but they have no way of knowing that that website is really the correct legitimate website that they're interacting with. Yes, there's TLS certificates that you can go and validate. Uh, there are like telltale signs, hopefully, in the URL address bar, but these things are tricky, and if you go by the uh, 
security zone uh, down on the, on the show floor, uh, we have two laptops set up next to each other. One is on a phishing website and the other one is not. Uh, and it's very, very hard to tell, right? Um, it, it, it just is. Uh, most of us here at the conference are security professionals. And even for us, it is tricky, uh, especially if you know that's not the only thing that we want to do on that web page. It's not all about validating URLs for us. We actually want to get the job done, right? We want to send an email. We want to log in. We want to get access to file. Um, so we're not spending that much time checking URLs every day. Um, and, and that really is kind of the primary problem here. And security keys are meant to address that. We specifically developed the security key technology together with industry to solve and, and address that problem. Um, and the way that that works is, there we go. The way that that works is we, um, the security key basically communicates locally to the hosts. In other words, you plug it in. Uh, there is information being sent from the host to the security key. It does validation also based on the origin, like where you are, where you're browsing to, and it will not release the signature, so to say, um, until it recognizes that it's on the correct website that it wants to interact with. And, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail here uh, in, in a couple of slides. So very, very simple. If you're on the correct URL, the security key works. If not, it doesn't, like pretty straightforward. Um, it's created with open standards, as I said earlier. Uh, we work in two standards bodies, in two standards organizations. The one is in the W3C, uh, World Wide Web Consortium. And recently, we reached W3C recommendation status. Uh, that means usually that web browsers kind of look at what the W3C is coming up with, uh, typically also are involved in the standardization process. And they usually pick up standards that reach recommended status or recommendation in the W3C. And that is why we've seen folks like Edge, uh, Mozilla, Firefox, of course, Chrome, as well as Safari and the Tech Preview actually, you know, take this seriously and start doing implementation. Uh, we've recently moved over, I guess, about three, four weeks ago, um, in anticipation of the launch today, which, which I'll show a demo about. Uh, we've moved over to the W3C standard um, as opposed to what we were doing before, which was kind of like a um, pre you know, fully W3C rectified standard called U2F, um, which is basically the protocol between a web server and your logged in device, right? So if you're a website and you want to implement this cool new stuff here, you need to understand the W3C web Authn protocol. There is another protocol involved here, which is called CTAP, the Client to Authenticator Protocol. That is still being standardized in FIDO, but a lot less, I guess, folks in the world really need to know about that protocol. That's the one that your device, your browser, your platform needs to communicate to the security key. Um, one way to communicate is using USB. There's a standardized framing and a format for doing this communication. Uh, if you are interested in developing security keys, then of course you need to understand that protocol. But if you're a web developer and you want to implement this on your website, you absolutely don't. You only need to understand WebAuthn. Um, if you want to make security keys, of course, it's an open standard. Anyone can participate. Anyone can make a security key. And Google will, you know, as folks know, will pretty much accept any security key from any vendor. As long as you adhere to the standards, that key will work uh, on, on Google properties. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that particular protocol here in a second. But the, um, the, the important thing here is like this is mediated by Chrome or by your browser or your platform uh, on your machine, uh, this communication. And then it goes over either USB, uh, NFC, near field communication, or Bluetooth low energy. Those are the three standardized transports uh, on that level. Um, so that's kind of like if you're interested, like how FIDO and, and, and W3C kind of both fit into to this process. A little bit of both in there. Um, last year at Next, we introduced the Titan security key. It has one more option, right? There are security keys out there from many vendors. Anyone can make security keys that, you know, um, behaves uh, according to the standard uh, and, and works with, with property supporting uh, WebAuthn or security keys. Uh, but we wanted to introduce one more option, um, one option that basically has a little bit of Google goodness in there. Uh, and that's what we did in the Titan security key. Um, essentially, as we said, you know, it's a phishing resistant second factor. We've said that a bunch of times. But more importantly, it includes a secure element with firmware that was written by Google, um, which you can then use and, and gives you this that little bit of, 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 of kind of extra goodness in there. Um, it's an open ecosystem. The key will work with any other website that understands WebAuthn. Um, and there's many of these different websites out there today. Um, here's the more detailed slide on how the security key actually works when you're trying to log in. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through this. Um, and if there's questions at the end, we can, we can delve in a little bit deeper. But I do think it's important to at least understand this at the uh, kind of like superficial level. So 
this gets one level below kind of just understanding that there's comms happening between these devices. Uh, so how this works is uh, when I try to log into www.google.com, uh, of course, my phone will send that request to the server. And the very next thing the server will do, once I've entered my username and my password, the server will generate a cryptographic challenge. Now, in this example, we assume that the user have already registered their security key with their Google account at some point in time before this happens, right? Registration is very simple. The key generates a unique public-private key key pair. It gives the public key to the service, Google in this case, and Google will store that against this particular account. So Alice, in this example, is trying to sign in, um, and Google knows that there is a particular public key that belongs to Alice on file uh, at, at the server, at Google. Um, and we send a cryptographic challenge, basically for freshness, right? We say, here is some random data. You're going to need to do something with that. We just pass that along. So the random data is passed along to the client, in this case, the phone. Um, the very next thing that happens is Chrome looks at, or the browser looks at the URL bar, or the web origin, and sees, ah, this is for google.com. Okay, that's cool, so we're going to remember that. Um, and then we're going to send that information on over the CTAP protocol. Remember, everything happening on the left side of the picture is over W3C WebAuthn. On the right side of the picture, that communication is happening via CTAP. Uh, so we're going to send this information from the browser to the security key, uh, over USB in this case. And we're going to include the challenge that the server sent, but we're also going to include kind of like the caller ID, like who is the actual property asking for the signature. Uh, we'll look at the URL bar, we'll strip that out, and we'll send that along over the USB protocol to the security key. Security key will then generate a cryptographic signature. So basically, it takes a challenge. It signs it using the private key that it generated over a year ago, or whenever we registered the key. Um, it generates this signature, and it sends the signature all the way back via the, um, the by USB protocol and via WebAuthn all the way back to the server. The server looks at this, sees that the challenge that it sent is correct. It is signed by the private key that the security key knows. The server doesn't know the private key, though. The server only knows the public key, but using public-private cryptography or public-private key cryptography, it can verify that the key knows the correct secret without ever exposing that secret to the server itself. Like, how great is that for data breaches, right? If something happens to the server nowadays, your passwords are exposed, you know, we can run through, it doesn't matter if the password is hashed or whatever, like rainbow tables and other stuff are out there, passwords get cracked. Um, because of the fact that we use symmetric authentication on the web today, your password can be cracked. In this example, even if someone, if there's a data breach over at the server side and things get compromised, yes, they'll have your username, they'll have your password, but they will never have your private key because that private key is never stored the server. The public key is stored on the server. That allows the server to know that you have the right security key, but it never allows the server to impersonate that said security key, which is really cool, really nifty. Um, the other thing, of course, here is that we sign. We don't only sign the challenge. We also sign the web origin. So the server is absolutely certain that you are looking at the correct website at the point in time when the security key was presented. So both of these two things are signed together, both the challenge and the web origin. Um, and that all gets sent you know, down to, to the server. If the user is looking at the incorrect website, the incorrect thing will be signed. Um, and the server will simply reject it. So pretty straightforward. Um, and, and we'll kind of look at something else here in more detail in a second. So what we're really here to talk about, and at this point, it's kind of old news, right? We've said it from this morning, or is this keynote, and then we reviewed it in the security spotlight session. Um, we wanted to make things a little easier for users. Uh, it's great to have multiple options in security keys, NFC, USB, uh, maybe a Bluetooth key that I can use. Um, but, you know, it's still an additional device that I have to carry around. How cool would it be if the thing that's already in my pocket, my mobile phone, could just be my security key for my Google account. Now we're going to say, well, that's not new. I've been using my phone to authenticate for years. Well, that's true. Uh, it started out with using SMS as a one-time password sent to a phone. Then we started looking at like authenticator applications running on the phone, generating one-time passwords. Uh, even push authentication nowadays, right? You get a message and you say yes. Uh, the technology that we're going to look at right now is very similar in the user experience, right? You also look at the phone and say yes to a message. The critical difference is that message is not going via the cloud. And, and there's some slides in here later where we kind of break that whole login process down and where we see the difference between traditional push-based authentication and this technology here. Because there's a local channel, a local proximity channel between the uh, laptop and, and my mobile phone, um, we can apply the same 
protocol which makes sure the user is looking at the right website at the point in time when they're trying to sign in. That really is kind of the breakthrough here. Very, very, very simple um, kind of concept, but obviously the implementation is hard because you have to deal with Bluetooth and different browsers and different platforms, but in the end, all these things kind of make up a cohesive whole, um, which, which gives you a user experience that users are used to, they've been doing it for years, but this time really giving them that, that elevated uh, threat protection, the phishing protection uh, that, that security keys uh, and the protocol have, have built in. Um, so pretty straightforward, right? And then there's one last thing here which we'll talk about a little bit later. If you happen to have a Pixel 3, uh, last year when we announced the Pixel 3, we we also mentioned that the Pixel 3 has a Titan M chip in there, so there's a cryptographic secure element built by Google, um, you know, that does a bunch of things. Uh, in that blog post at the time, we kind of alluded to the fact that, hey, maybe later this thing can also be used as a security key, and I guess that time is now. So on a Pixel 3, we're actually using and storing your um, FIDO key material, the kind of cryptographic material that we use to generate these signatures directly in that uh, secure element. Uh, and the secure element actually happens to be hardwired to the volume down button on my Pixel phone, which is why I have to press that button during authentication on this particular device, which means if there is something else running on the phone, it'll never be able to physically press the button, which is kind of the same premise with security keys. That's why we require a button press at the point in time when we want to do signature. Um, even if there's something else maybe malicious running, it hopefully will not be able to physically exercise my, uh, my security keys button, uh, but we'll talk about that. So let's now jump into a demo. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask folks to switch over to the laptop right here, um, and I'll bring up the, the phone here in a second, but let's start, this is a user who signed into Gmail, right? Um, let's refresh and make sure everything looked good, cool. Um, I already use security keys, uh, and this is kind of the state that we want users to be in. We, we really want users setting up their like phones built in security key to already have something else that they can use if this process fails. That's why we're saying beta, uh, not because of the technology necessarily having an inherent problem, but you know you need Bluetooth for this to work, and you're not always going to be on a machine that has Bluetooth, right? You have a desktop. If you sign in on an unsupported platform, let's say I don't know, like Windows versions older than Windows 10 younger, older than Windows 10, uh, so lower, uh, you might have, have a challenge. So, so the protocol right now is supported on pretty much all Android 7 Plus phones and Windows 10, Chrome OS, and, um, and Mac OS. Um, but again, Bluetooth is a requirement. So we kind of want you to have a backup. So this user is in that perfect state. If I click on my account details over here um, and I review my security settings, you will see under two-step verification that this user has a couple of security keys already set up. So this user happens to have a Titan USB key, one right here, and a Titan Bluetooth key, this one right here. So these things are already set up on the account. Um, today, we see this promo happening. And the promo says, hey, by the way, you have a compatible Android phone already on your account. The way we know this is this user already signed in to their Android device using this Google account at some previous time. So we were kind of able to correlate this and say, hey, we think you have a compatible phone for this technology. Um, this promo might take a little while to show up for your account. However, if you just click the add security key button, you should immediately be able to use this technology that was already released this morning. So if you click add security key, which I'll do in this case, you'll see all your various options. If you don't have any eligible phones, it'll go straight into the, hey, add a USB or Bluetooth a security key. In this case, I happen to have a compatible Pixel 3 on my account. If you have more than one phone, they'll all show up here and you can pick what you want to use. Um, I've got my Pixel 3 at this point, which is what I'm going to activate. Um, going to click it. It'll tell me a bunch of like things like I need Bluetooth and location and other things on, on the phone for this technology to work. Uh, don't need pairing. That's kind of the critical part here, right? With these other Bluetooth keys that we spoke about earlier, um, we needed pairing, right? We need to pair this device with our phone or with our laptop for it to work. Um, we listen to our users and they don't like pairing. It's hard. If you ever try to pair a phone and a laptop together, like, it's not easy. Um, we wanted to get away from that. So we said, what can we do to make the protocol easier? Um, so we basically came up with a little extension to the WebAuthn protocol that's standardized right now. And this extension allows for pairingless secure communication between your laptop and your phone. Um, the uh, protocol extension is being standardized in the standards organization, FIDO as we speak. Um, it has not completely been ratified yet. It takes a while. Um, we have decided as Chrome to do the first implementation of that. Any other browser, of course, is free to do the same thing, but we wanted to get it out there so we can start testing with this particular protocol. So we expect other browsers to pick it up right now or at some point too, but right now Chrome is the browser where this protocol is implemented. So anyway, we'll add. 
In the end, it'll say, hey, everything's cool, so I'll go back. And now I see three security keys on my account. I've got my Google Pixel 3, I've got my USB key, and I have my Bluetooth key. Uh, so now let's see how this works during sign-in. So I will close this window. I will open a new incognito window. And at this point, I'm going to try and display my Pixel 3 on the screen. So let's move that out of the way. All right, so this is my phone, what I have here. Um, and I'm going to try and access Gmail. So gmail.com, I am going to enter my demo account credentials. And at this point in time, I should see the new UI appearing, uh, which you know tells me I can use either USB or Bluetooth, of course, but I'm going to pick to use my phone. That's the default if you have a phone on your account. You've seen a message pop up. This is the Pixel 3 experience, which says I have to hold down the volume down button, which I'm going to do. I'm going to click it and hold it down until the blue check mark appears. It's going to be local Bluetooth connectivity between these two devices. And once that completes, I will be allowed to sign in to my account. And at this point, it did all of those checks that we spoke about earlier. There was challenges passed, the phone signed it, the key material happened to be stored in the Titan M chip, crypto happened there, uh, and we also made sure on the way back that I was actually looking at the legitimate website here, the real mail.google.com, and not some other malicious website, perhaps. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of the demo. Um, so we'll go back to the slide deck at this point, and we'll see what happened there. Uh, so how this fit in, same picture, right? I'm just going to go through it really quickly because we really discussed this already. And all the, the point of this picture is just to show it's exactly the same technology and the same protocol that we've, be, we've been using like with USB and physical Bluetooth security keys in place here. Same thing, right? We're sending data over. It can be sent via either USB, NFC, or BLE. At this point, it was sent via BLE. Um, and phone signed it, sent it all the way back, and the server validated that this was the correct um, key, like the correct secret, right, that signed this, um, this cryptographic challenge. So pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I don't have to go into this too much. Of course, it offers a stronger defense against phishing. That's kind of the point we're trying to make. And it ver verifies user's identity and URL, uh, or the URL that you're visiting. This is kind of the takeaway slide, right? There's two things to remember from this presentation. This is what security keys do. Uh, it's about the protocol. It's not about the physical form factor. Uh, ever since we started down the path of security keys, the intent was always to bring the thing in your pocket to kind of you know, be that technology that you can use without having to make the user carry around something else. Um, you know, of course, security keys has its place. Um, you still use that to, um, to bootstrap an account, uh, have that as your backup, but you now have one additional option. It's just technologically much easier to make these devices than implement everything directly on the, uh, the device itself in, inside the phone. Um, so, so kind of as, you know, the last, one of the last uh, sections here, um, I want to just show the difference between um, the non-security key posh-based authentication protocol and the push based authentic or sorry and the the, the the BLE based authentication protocol right so so the push based authentication protocol uh, the one that goes by the cloud normally that you know even we offer it as Google right it's been uh, the, the name that we call it is Google Prompt. Um, so you can activate Google Prompt. You could have you know, set that up as your 2SV mechanism for ages. Uh, we actually changed it over a couple of months, maybe a year ago, uh, so that you can set that up as your default option. Uh, so if you activate two-step verification or multi-factor authentication on a Google account today, uh, Google Prompt is the option that you're going to get. It's great. Like, it's very like straightforward. It has the same user experience, roughly, as what we've seen here. but it sends the messages via the cloud. So if you look at what's going on on this uh, diagram right here, um, this is how users get tricked, right? User goes, and the user goes to a website. Uh, at this point, I call it phishing.com, but it's you know a little bit more subtle than that in real life. Uh, I end up going to a website that looks a lot like Google, but it's not really the real Google website. What's in essence happening is I'm visiting a website that's proxying all of my information and all of the data between the real Google and me. So that's what we're seeing. In step three, um, that's Google. That's the real Google servers. However, I'm not interacting with it. I'm interacting with something that is interacting with it. So like they're proxying everything back um, to my um, to my machine and to my browser. Um, so what's happening is user is interacting. They're typing in their username. Bad guy's getting it. They're typing in their password. Bad guy's getting it. Um, they're sending it onto the real Google. Real Google happily sends the push message to the real user who is trying to sign in at this point. But of course, when I say yes to that message, 
I'm not signing me in. I'm signing the bad guy in. And there's no way for Google to know whether they're interacting with the legitimate um, user or with someone proxying everything on the user's behalf. And that's really the problem and one of the reasons why these push messages contain other metadata, right? It says things like the location you're trying to sign in from. So you might be like, why are you telling me where I'm signing in from? I know where I'm signing in from. Well, it's because if someone is proxying that message, hopefully they're not in the same location as you. And you'll check that message and see, oh, this guy's trying to sign in from a different country or a different state. I'm clearly going to say no to this message. Using IPG location mostly, so like nowadays it's very easy for folks to um, set up VPN tunnels that kind of you know pop out in roughly the same neighborhood or areas that you're in. Uh, so that's that's another challenge, right? There's there's way to circumvent some of these technologies. Other push authentication um, technologies show you the IP address of who you're seeing. Who knows what their IP is when they're trying to sign in? Like, you're not going to go and check out what is my public-facing IP address every time that you do one of these messages. So even that kind of stuff doesn't really, really work. It's it, Sure, we're putting more of the burden back to the user where they can potentially figure out whether they're interacting with a legitimate site or not, but it's not that easy to tell. We wanted to solve that problem. We wanted to say, well, why don't we make it the technology's problem and not the user's problem? And that's really where we ended up here. Much simpler picture, right? The user is now looking at the phishing website. Bad guy is still up there to the left. Um, but this time round, because the communication to the mobile phone is directly from the user's machine to the phone and not as in the previous picture from the Google Cloud to the phone, we're able to tell the phone the URL that the user is looking at. Um, and the phone will either refuse to sign the message or will sign it, but will you know, send back the data to the cloud. In this case, that what we're seeing is the uh, browser is sending back phishing.com in that signature, and Google is going like, no, 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 no. That's not the website the user should be looking at when they're logging in. So, you know, really, really straightforward. Um, if you if you think about the technology, again, you know, really, I think critically, you know, important, but 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 very very simple. Um, and and that's how you know we or at least the difference between using traditional push-based mechanisms, which again, like, there's nothing wrong with it inherently. Um, it's certainly better than not having any 2SV at all, and certainly better than some other 2SV uh, options. But if you want this enhanced level of protection in the you know, early days, you had to get one of these. Now you have one more option and just turn your phone into it. So, so the prompt on the phone looks very much the same. If you don't happen to have a Pixel 3 device, the prompt actually looks pretty much exactly the same as the, uh, the Google prompt technology. If you look at that screen there on the right and you look at the one here, it's very much similar. We don't show you any of the other stuff anymore, right? We don't show you the location or the IP address or anything like that because at this point it's not important. We know these things are local. That's the important part. So to kind of end off and wrap up here, um, it's convenient, right? Users are prompted to verify their sign-in on their phone. It's pretty straightforward. There is a one-time simple enrollment. We've seen that. It's pretty straightforward. You don't need to install any apps on the phone. Um, you don't even need to upgrade the software of your Android phone. Um, it happens automatically in the background. Your phone should have it at this point. Uh, all Android 7 Plus devices should have this. Um, and the way that we technically get this to the phone is an integration with something called Google Play Services, which is like a back-end component that lives in Android phones um, that interact with, with uh, Google properties. So if you have access to Gmail and other services on the device, typically this module is already present and is constantly updating in the background. Uh, and that's what we're using to deliver this functionality to devices going you know, back a couple of years. Um, right now, it's available to more than 50%. If you look at the... Um, you know, distribution of Android devices. More than 50% of users is running 7 Plus, uh, so uh, available to more than 50% of the Android market. Um, and it's free, right? You don't have to pay anything for it. You can just enable it. The only thing you need is a compatible device. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, there's, you know, one more thing here, uh, which is if you happen to have a Pixel 3 device, uh, which has the Titan M chip built into it, um, we will actually be using very much the same way that we differentiate regular security keys versus Titan security keys. It's kind of the same way that we differentiate, um, you know, the uh, built-in security key on Android versus the built-in security key on Android Pixel 3. Um, kind of the same thing. It's just a little bit more trust in where those keys are actually stored uh, and in the way that you exercise it. Again, I won't you know, I don't want to go into too much detail on, on, on the differences here and, and say the one is necessarily better than the other. Remember, the attack we're trying to prevent against here is remote phishing. We're trying to prevent someone that's in a different country or, you know, in a different you know, location than you, um, trying to sign in because that's the threat that's scalable. That's the thing that we see on the web. That's also the stuff that we, um, that you see uh, speak about earlier, right? If we look at, you know, the amount of phishing websites that's springing up every month, it's staggering. Um, that's the type of thing we want to protect against. And for that, it doesn't really matter where on your phone the key is stored, right? It can be stored on 
the file system or in the TEE or in, even in the Titan M chip. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, but we do have this kind of additional level of protection, um, and the same as with the physical Titan security key for folks who, who care about that. Um, Last slide here, it's available now um, in beta, as we said. Um, it's available on Android 7 phones, works with Bluetooth-enabled uh, Chrome browser on Chrome OS, Mac OS X, and Windows 10. Um, and you can use it both on your personal Gmail account as well as on any of our enterprise accounts. Uh, and if an administrator set up an organization to require a security key, this is now a valid way to kind of, you know, I guess, address that particular constraint where you can set up your phone and it'll happily satisfy the constraint of using a security key on, on that account.